like to welcome everybody. I'm Neringa Klumbita, professor of anthropology um, and uh, faculty member at the Haliger Center for Russian and Post-Soviet Studies. So this is the annual Lithuania program event, and I would like uh, to thank Dr. Steven Norris, who is here, the director of the Haviger Center and professor of history, uh, for his support of the Lithuania program. He was actually the founder of this program at um, Miami University, and also uh, the Department of Journalism and Media and Humanities Center, who are the sponsors of this event. And uh, it is my great honor to introduce today uh, Rita Milute, a journalist from Lithuania. She came all the way uh, from Lithuania to meet with you, so it's a very, uh, you should feel very special. And I would like to start that introduction from um, just a very, because I myself was born also in Lithuania from a personal uh, memory. So in 1991, um, January 13th, I wo woke up um, by the trembling, I was woken up by the trembling building. And it wasn't, it wasn't an earthquake. It was Soviet tanks that were running through the street. So that day changed all of the people's lives who lived in Lithuania. And that day was very much important for Lithuanian people because Lithuania, I guess that was a decisive moment. There were people who died, um, and, uh, but ultimately, you know, the decision was made to move those stamps from the country and Lithuania became fully independent, although it announced independence in 1990 before the tanks were sent to Lithuania. So, um, uh, this year marks uh, 34 years of Lithuania's independence. And it is something that is even more special than it was 10 years ago or, or 20 years ago, because we know what is happening in Ukraine. So Lithuanians think very often that this is their destiny that is awaiting. And sometimes we think, you know, that those who are in Lithuania, they live at the frontiers of the war. So Rita Miluta was your age when those tanks were running for the first time through Lithuania in 1991. And she uh, joined the liberation movement. She actually was a student um, a little before, right? Um, at, the, at Vilnius University, a student of journalism, and she decided to quit and join the liberation movement. Uh, and that was more interesting, you know, that sitting in classes and studying from the <laughs> books, uh, just learning from real life and from Lithuanian liberation movement. And uh, she joined soon Voice of America, and she visited the park that is in Cincinnati and the museum, I don't know if you know. Um, and uh, later on worked as a journalist. Um, she was the head of the news of Radio M, M Vienna's, uh, M, M1, right? M first, uh, the first private radio station in Eastern Europe. Um, is, since 2001, she was deputy of general manager of Lithuanian national uh, TV and radio. Um, head of the TV department. Uh, she also was the head of the news department of Lithuanian, okay, LNK TV, and so now all abbreviations that I don't, it's Lithuanian independent television, yes. right? That's how it's tra it translates. Um, it was owned by Swedes. <laughs> it was owned by Swedes, but it's still independent. <laughs> it's second largest private TV station in Lithuania. And uh, from 2003 to 2008, she was the host of the main evening um, Lithuanian t um, television news uh, program, um, Panorama. Uh, she is uh, the journalist and host of Lithuanian radio and television since 2003, and journalist host of Liberty TV since 2017. Um, so when the invasion, the full-scale invasion in 2022 happened. Um, um, Rita joined the volunteer forces 
and uh, she also goes to Ukraine um, as a reporter and a journalist. So you will see some images from Ukraine. And uh, today's uh, discussion is supposed to cover all the time that I've been telling you about, from 1990 when Lithuania first became independent um, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Through those 30 years, and now you know that moment in the history when we face you know, the largest war in Europe, um, uh, Russia's war against Ukraine. So thank you very much for coming. Welcome everybody. And I will ask questions first, and then you know we will open it for discussion, and you will be able to ask any questions you would like to ask. Um, all right. So I know we can sit. Um, so I will start uh, with the first question about the collapse of the Soviet Union. So your career as a journalist uh, started at the time when the Soviet Union was collapsing. Could you tell what it meant to report about the crumbling empire and the liberation of Lithuania? And what were the challenges Lithuanian journalists faced at the beginning of independence? Well, thank you for having me here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and let's go to the answer if I will be able to give okay. the answers to your questions. If I will not make myself clear, please do not hesitate and just correct that I'm trying to answer the question which was not said, <laughs> okay? Uh, so when I started, I was lucky to start my career exactly when the Soviet Union was uh, collapsing. So it was easy for me not to be spoiled by Soviet uh, way of writing or broadcasting because I just had no chance to be, to be affected by this. Uh, the problem was uh, equipment. We had no recorders, we had no microphones, we had no cameras and so on. But by comparison with the situation which came later, mm -hmm. when the Soviet tanks uh, arrived to, to, to Vilnius streets, it was of course nothing. Because you can buy all the equipment, you can learn how to report, you can learn how to how to research, how to find information, and how to present it. That's what we were doing. We, we were um, learning by working. And uh, it was just, you know, it was my best years, maybe, <laughs> because I was twice younger, and I had chance to, to be in the profession which I was dreaming about since why I was a kid. Right. So, um, so Lithuania is going to celebrate its on March 11th, 34th anniversary of independence. Um, so, when you look back at those three decades, um, what significant moments emerge in Lithuania's media and uh, your journalistic career? Are there any signature projects that you would like to tell us about? I never saw thought very much about it, but I just recall when I was working for VOA, mm -hmm. one of the topics always was Lithuania's membership in NATO and European Union. At the beginning, it was like a kid's dream, which will never happen, because we had a lot of studies made also here in, in the United States that Baltic states will never join NATO because there is no way to defend them. Mm -hmm. I remember very clearly those days. Despite that, in 2004, Lithuania became NATO and EU member, and I said to myself, that's it. My life as a life of the journalist will be boring since now, because mm -hmm. nothing will happen. Never can laugh at it. But, <laughs> but it was most important uh, highlights of, of, of my profession because I really was trying to explain to people why it is important for Slovenia to be a NATO member and now we see how it is important because if we wouldn't be I am absolutely sure that Lithuania wouldn't be independent right now so nothing more important than that so 
I don't know if students know, but NATO, it's, if it's a NATO country, it means, you know, that NATO defend every country that is its member, right, based on the Article 5. So that's why it is um, so important for, for Lithuania, which is a rather not, not you know, a big, um, a big country and could not defend itself. So the war in Ukraine changed the course of Ukrainian, Lithuanian, and in general European history. So what was it like for you to learn about the full-scale invasion? And um, I was just shocked, as everyone probably who, who, who <coughs> was informed all of a sudden what happened in, in Kiev. I was expected, expecting, sorry, I'm, I'm almost sleeping by my... Yeah, so in Lithuania now it's <laughs> yeah, late. So midnight, but just please forgive me. So when I have heard that it started, I wasn't surprised. Uh, but I was surprised that they came to Kiev. It was complete shock because I never expected that they will do this as a capital city. And of course, all, all the things which uh, what became uh, known later, all those torches, killings, rapes, and so on, everything was too much unexpected because it couldn't be expected by normal people with which I hope I still am. And I was crying at the in the beginning at the beginning of full scale invasion I somehow I had to manage to go to work to to look calm, to look uh, you know credible and to explain things while interviewing somebody or just making reports, but it was very hard. And here, Neringa doesn't know, but she chose the photo to keep here. The guy you can see here, uh, Baldwin, he is a man of a Lithuania's rifleman union, as, as I am also. Uh, we shared some shifts during COVID uh, pandemia. At the hospitals, we were taking shifts as uh, members of that union, and uh, so we had a lot of time to chat and and, and so on, and we became good friends. And like uh, in March, end of the March, he called me and said, "You know, you should go to Ukraine." I said, "Okay, why?" Because uh, he said, "You should go to see how people who live there, and you will see that." they are making their best to resist and they will survive. So you don't have to think that Ukraine will fall. So that's how I started to go to Ukraine as a volunteer. We're bringing uh, humanitarian and military aid. Cars, um, protection for the soldiers and such as things. So we will return to the topic of Ukraine a bit later. Um, I still would like to ask a few questions. And so you mentioned several times, um, and, and you mentioned that when you report um, that this is our war, um, that the war in Ukraine is our war, that Ukrainians are fighting for our freedom. So um, could you tell us why Ukraine cannot lose this war? Because they are def defending Europe the rest of the Europe, they are saving time for us, which we, if we are intelligent people, would use for the preparation to be better uh, prepared to, to defend ourselves. Because Russia is a country which never stops <coughs> by, by, by itself if it's not stopped by force. That's why I am absolutely convinced that Ukraine is fighting for the rest of the Europe. And therefore, we are trying to fight, to, to, to find the ways helpful. Right. So, um, so Lithuania, uh, so it has been a leader in Europe advocating for Ukraine, uh, whether it concerns military assistance or Ukraine's um, membership in the EU and NATO. So what are the lessons that Europe could take from Lithuania? And what is um, the current state um, in the EU regarding the support uh, to Ukraine? Well, uh, I would be happy if I may 
if I would be able to say that everyone in Lithuania shares the opinion that uh, Lithuania is the best uh, defender of Ukraine's uh, future in the Europe because we have a lot of uh, politicians who are not so brave and they are trying not to they share the view of some politicians in the U in Europe who say that do not escalate I mean <laughs> what if they are talking because the war is going people are being killed every hour and they talk about not escalating the situation instead of uh, trying to stop Russia mm -hmm. but uh, since we do have politicians who support Ukraine it is very important to try to explain to people in Europe and also in the United States that Ukraine shouldn't be left alone because it is at first a very uh, huge injustice to leave them alone and uh, not the humane. Not humane. Just, I mean, if somebody is uh, trying to kill the man, the woman, or the country, which was if Russia is doing, somebody who is stronger should defend and should help, must help to, to stay alive. So I will shift a little bit um, our attention to the US. In 2011, you interviewed then uh, the um, Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, and in your first question, you mentioned that Eleanor Roosevelt only allowed female reporters to uh, her press conferences, forcing uh, so editors to hire women. Your own example shows that there is nothing that women cannot achieve. So what do you think is the role of women in journalism and reporting? I have a lot of female students here. Mm -hmm. I don't know, actually, if journalism has uh, so-called uh, woman's face or <laughs> I, I don't know I never uh, I am sure that there is no huge difference who you are man or woman I mean it depends on uh, your values on your on your education on your perception of the world of your readiness to be ready when you have to be because you are a journalist but I don't know I don't have an answer to your question actually so that's something for us to think about. But probably, if I would try to find an answer, is to to be presented. Mm -hmm. Because if you look around, a lot of uh, journals are men, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so even being a journalist while you are a woman, it's sort of a challenge. Okay, so let's leave it um, at here. Um, we can talk more about it. So my last question was, if you could interview President Biden, um, no, th this is the second you could ask. So if you interviewed President Biden, what would you ask? Dear, that wall, their lines wall, just give, no, I mean, it just, um, I, I was trying to, to <coughs> speak more ethically. I would ask, uh, why don't you give uh, weapons to Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Just very, very simply. Because it's, I do believe that the United States have enough power, have enough finance, and don't have enough will to stop the war. The United States would <coughs> be able to stop if there is a war which I can't see right now. And now the last question. Um, and I, we will open to your questions, of course. So what advice do you have to Miami students who are going to be our future leaders? OK. <laughs> Don't let world world to be fooled. I mean, that is your task. If someone is saying, 
the aggression is just another opinion or the other side of opinion. No, it's just full statement. I mean, you have to be, you are clever and you have to be brave enough to say, no, it's bullshit. I mean, don't fool me and don't fool the rest of the human. So you have to be strong and, and stand by what you believe in. Yes. Yes, and there is a lot of courage um, that we can learn from you, and also the same thing, right? To stand uh, and defend that um, democratic values and, and human value, uh, human rights values, and also that human decency that I very often see <laughs> in in your but journalism. It's, but it's very normal. I mean, I know a lot of people who share my values. I I get to see that you share my values and. If not, I wouldn't be here. Uh, when, I, when my son was a uh, teenager, um, we were talking a lot about what you have to be in your life, what you would like, what you have to um, do and what not to do, which is even more sometimes important. And I was thinking by myself uh, what would be the right answer, how to simplify it. It's very easy. Do nothing that makes you feel ashamed against uh, in front of your kid. That's it. Simple. Simple. Well, at the same time, we can say that the democratic world is shrinking as Russia now today bombs uh, Donetsk Oblast, right? And, and taking uh, more villages over. Because Russia doesn't need free people. Russia's goal is to kill free people. Russia needs slaves. And if Russia wins in Ukraine, its goal will be to to suppress much more people and make them slaves or kill them. So I will sh show some slides, and I'll open this for for the discussion. Uh, so the slides come, um, these are the uh, photos made by uh, Rita Milute in Ukraine from her trips, um, different trips, um, and op this is the open floor to, to your questions, so ask questions. So in between the reporting from there, you have a different perspective from local reporters reporting from the war? Can you speak for them? Do you think that as a Lithuanian reporter um, reporting on the war, what kind of different perspective are you bringing versus Ukrainian journalists? Uh, Lithuanian reporting, yeah. how is it different from Ukrainian journalism? Uh, <coughs> perhaps the main difference is that we are not at war. I mean, they are fighting, and for this natural reasons, they have uh, some limits in to report we don't have just uh, responsibility I, I never I never use pictures or video um, which may disclose location and to become a reason people be killed and soldiers positions and weapons but nothing more On those images yeah, sure. because yeah, um, what do you think are some of the um, limitations or some of the biggest um, restrictions on y Ukraine not joining NATO and do you feel that they should as as um, as um, Lithuania was well I wish that Ukraine joined mm -hmm. NATO and we have to remember that Ukraine by now is associated member of European Union who remember that not a lot of people I mean they were invited which means they have certain status right and russia is bombing associated partner associated member of the european union meanwhile the european union is mainly watching it peacefully and saying we can't find weapons but we will make a coalition inside the european union to find weapons outside the european union and the same with nato i mean it of course ukraine is not invited to nato because of an argument that uh, it can't join NATO while at war. What Putin hears, 
Uh huh. So you can bomb them, mm -hmm. because while you are bombing them, they will never become NATO member. So if I would be Putin, I would be clapping my hands. Instead of saying, "Okay, let's take them under our defense and do not let Putin kill them," but the perspective is not very clear and 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 happy and right. Do you think that then if they join NATO during the war, that that would stop it, or that the U.S. and the EU would have to get involved in direct conflict before the war would stop? I also wish it would happen, because as I mentioned before, the United States has power to stop it, and I'm afraid Ukraine will not join NATO while the war is going on, uh, and. Personally, I do think that the United States will join the war, if I may say so. But it just takes some time, maybe a couple of years, and a lot of people will be killed before it will happen. Did I answer your question? I'm not sure. Um, I'm wondering, do you think that their membership would be enough of a direct threat to stop Putin from continuing the invasion, or that an actual conflict would have to occur? I think that in a certain uh, terms it could stop Putin at least. I do not think that Putin would be a bomb capital city of the member of NATO member state. But you know, just it is just my opinion and I can't prove it, but I think so. Kind of changing the subject here, I'm looking at all these pictures here and seeing a very common theme. Um, did you get to talk to any Ukrainians? And if you did, what did they have to say about all this damage? Yes, I had a lot of chances to talk to people whom we are trying to help. Uh, and they are, they are suffering, and they are always saying that we will not surrender. You might kill us. I mean, not us, but some, someone could kill us, but we will not surrender. Okay, I guess um, when you say we do not surrender, is that like the citizens or is that the uh, the military? Both. 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 Okay. Yes. yes, we do have contacts with military whom we are helping uh, mainly, but we also meet um, civilians. Okay. So. That makes sense. Thank you. So, I stopped. Oh no, it didn't stop. But. <coughs> I, we have um, deoccupied, as Ukrainians call it, this action. So it was uh, retaken by Ukrainians, and we were passing by, and I saw piano in the on the fifth floor. So this is how 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 lives look when the Russian world comes. And then I was I I was looking at that piano, and I was. I catch myself on, on, on a thinking that if you have piano in your uh, flat or house, there is no chance that there was no playing Tchaikovsky, you know, famous Russian composer. <coughs> if you have piano, no chance not to play Tchaikovsky. And what I'm trying to say that I think that there are at home some, some, some of Please restart me. <laughs> restart it. <laughs> so, some family has piano, somebody was playing Tchaikovsky, and no family maybe, and certainly no Tchaikovsky anymore in this flat. Because Russia came with it's all the nice words about culture and so on. And we had a question. So, what do, what do you think an end to the war would look like? Because uh, Russia's like military production is like higher than most of the NATO members combined, and billions of dollars are being sent to Ukraine, and it doesn't seem like Putin will allow like a NATO like what, a Ukraine to become a NATO state because he obviously doesn't want NATO missiles right next to him, and um, yeah, what do you think? It's again my wish. Um, 
that NATO sends enough weapons to Ukraine. Uh, maybe, not maybe, but uh, I would like uh, NATO to send to Ukraine uh, aviation, um, F-16 or something like this, just to protect uh, the sky, to protect borders, uh, patriot systems, which means that people would be safe and Russian rockets would be uh, destroyed before they land on, on the to the Ukrainian cities. Uh, Russia will always be an enemy. I mean, they will always threaten the world that we will use um, all the weapons we can make. I do not have illusions that Russia will change. No. Not in my life, at least. Not in your life. So, so given that Russia won't change, do you think constantly supplying Ukraine with weapons is going to just further escalate the war? and prolong it and not bring it to an end? No, I do not think that it means escalation. You, when, you, uh, when you meet uh, somebody, let's say, uh, the gang at the street, in the street, who is uh, trying to frighten you, if you are afraid, if you are not able to resist, probably he will beat you, right? But you, if you are well trained, if you have uh, possibilities to defend yourself, uh, you can frighten him, do not touch me, because you will end lying on the floor. So that's the way we should act as Russians, I think. Because otherwise, I will never be tired to repeat, they will never stop. They never stop, we saw it in history. Uh, I do not share opinion that it's escalation. I mean, yes, we have to frighten them. Do not touch us. Some like common misconceptions or like something you wish Americans would understand about what's actually going on there. I wish I know. I would know. I mean, maybe the first one that it's uh, something that doesn't uh, that isn't important to us because we are so far away. Another one. It is not clear what actually is going on there. It is clear. Ukraine is attacked. The kids are kidnapped and forced to, forcibly moved to, to Russia. I mean, what am I talking about? What is unclear? Which part it is unclear? The people somehow manage to pretend that they do not understand. And I don't know how to change it. Maybe just by talking. Maybe just this is the reason why I'm here and in my broken English trying to explain you what's going on. Can I interject on that? When you say when people try to pretend that they don't know what's going on, are you referring to the American media when you say that? Partially, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Because so they're ignoring the situation at hand? I wouldn't call maybe it ignoring, but you know, we as a journalist always can find problems which will be closer to your local audience. And it depends on us to explain why it is important. I mean, America always was defender of democracy and uh, defender of those who are weaker, right? Why is that great America? Um, so whenever you had made the decision to go and report in Ukraine, what as a journalist did you do to prepare for that shift in your job? Do you mean, did I prepare somehow especially or? Like how did you train to go and report during a war, like in okay, very like sensitive no. situations? I did, did, did not nothing special because it was not my first time to go into the war. Okay. But of course, you you have you have to, you have to be in mind that you, if you hear sirens, you go to the shelter. I mean, you shouldn't be the uh, enough fool to pretend that it doesn't uh, affect you. Of course, it will. But nothing very special. How 
How does the morale in uh, Ukraine in military and civilians uh, look now since the front line never really shifted last year? That's a painful question because the answer is, is uh, it's worse than it was like half a year ago. Because you know, they, all the time where they are, they were fed with the promises that the planes are coming, the weapons are coming, the animation is coming, uh, high marses, more high marses are coming, and so on, and it never happened. So they feel abandoned, and they do not try to, to fight it, because there is no reason to fight it. But they still hope that the promises will be fulfilled. So, with the American presidential election coming up in November, do you think that it's possible that if we have a new president in office that America could, could potentially completely withdraw from Ukraine? I wish that new presidents will um, understand, I wanted to say, but maybe he understands very clearly right now. But I wish that American president will not uh, have a wish to be under the Putin's uh, management, or how to say. I mean, who would be uh, happy seeing that uh, Putin takes uh, power on you? So I hope that, you know, and you see, it is not very painful for United States to to provide what Ukraine needs. Well, it's actually not. I mean, it's not a half of a budget or something like that. It could be not easily, but possibly done. So I hope mm -hmm. that it will happen. Yeah, you? Oh, so I'm hearing a lot about how, um, how Ukraine is not receiving proper funding, but on our end of it, we see we're sending a lot of money to Ukraine. Where do you think that money is going, and how do you think that money could be reallocated to help them in the in the right way? Or what could America do to, I guess, you know, put their foot down for this to be ended in general? Uh, yes, the corruption in Ukraine is a problem. It is, really. But I do not think it's so huge that uh, it's the main reason that Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainians can't uh, achieve any achievements in, in front line. Uh, this, I think, it, it is a mistake to think so. I mean, of course, Ukrainians has to work on it. And here we have, have, here we have two problems. Lithuania, uh, back into 1990s, also was poor. Uh, known to nobody and no nowhere, and yes, it was corrupted country, as all Soviet, all countries occupied by Soviets were corrupted, right? But somehow, United States and the rest of the world helped us. It means that there is a chance to fight corruption, right? With the help, with the finances from the rest of the world, and uh, if. Ukraine would be supplied by proper ammunition and weaponry, it would help to to move faster and to resist. Okay. That you make it pretty clear that answers your question. Thank you. Ukrainians about uh, the removal of General Zeluzhny, just because I from what I've seen online, you know, it seems to be pretty unpopular, but can't really trust everything you see online, so I'm just wondering if you've heard or seen anything. Yes, uh, I was asking those uh, military uh, fighters, soldiers actually, and also civilians. Zaluzhny was enormously popular. I mean, there is no explanation how commander could be so popular, but maybe the answer is that he is very human, actually. I mean, I know people who know him very well, and they confirmed that he actually was crying because of deaths, of, 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 of lots of death of soldiers. The new commander is not that popular. I mean, he is absolutely unpopular. It's like antipode of Zaluzhny. 
which doesn't mean he is bad uh, in strategy of, of war, but he isn't isn't popular. And mm -hmm. I guess Zelensky is losing here. I mean, people are asking why he changed Solzhenitsyn. I mean, at least there was no clear explanation why is what why 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 it was done. But well, Solzhenitsyn had to present something to the Western uh, countries. Like uh, okay, I'm trying to do changes. I'm trying to restart or how to call this all the machinery and system, and let's see how it will work. And I guess just to add to that, I know there's a lot of talk about like Zelensky feeling threatened by his illusion. Do you buy any of that? Okay. Just, it's not so important. I guess this wasn't the, the best reason. Yes, I mean. I heard a lot of people comparing uh, this war to the colonial wars because Russia is kind of the last colonial power that colonized Ukraine in the past, colonized Lithuania in the past, colonized, uh, still colonizes a lot of territory. Do you feel that, uh, so like, kind of like when Great Britain was fighting with India or, or France was fighting in Algeria, so that Algeria could free itself from being a colony of France. Do you agree with this kind of comparisons? Do you think that this is a colonial war, that Russia is trying to maintain the colonies that it had? I mean, I just want to be sure. Do I, do I share opinion that Russia is, is, is fighting the colonial war just in order to retain its and lost that, territories? That's, that's and, and that Russia is the yes. colonial empire in this moment. Yeah, they officially declared by themselves. Putin said that we, I want to restore the Soviet Union. He said that it's the biggest mistake of last century. I mean, it's officially said, and I can't understand why the leaders of the world do not listen what he is not trying to find it. Yes, I do think so. Thanks. I don't, I don't know that I, that a lot of people in this country realize that Russia is the colonial power. I don't think even. But just imagine if, if uh, British would say, we would like to retain India. <coughs> what the world would, would say, we all can imagine, right? But no one says to Putin, but stop. Stop even thinking about that. And there's sort of questions over here, or just seeing the signs which are happens. Maybe we could have a short interlude, and I will show you uh, Rita Milute reporting. So that's in Lithuanian. So I hope you all learned Lithuanian by now. <laughs> yes, um, you have to. Just <coughs> oh. Kaip laidoje draugus, kurie den gyventum, jai nekaras. Pirmoji istorija bus apie Muriką, toks jo šaukinys. Aleksandras gimė vakarų Sibirę, į Ukrainą tėvai ir tėvežio vaikystėje. The program on the YouTube channel, uh, the title is uh, Holiday UA. By holiday, you would ask, I mean, what a phrase a person would call it holiday or vacation. That's because I, uh, I, I'm going to Ukraine uh, during my vacation. I mean, I'm not going to business trip, I just go as a volunteer. It means I go between my programs. So the title is um, vacation, right? Vacation is more precise than holiday, right? Okay, so. Okay, so, and here's a story about the guy whose name is uh, uh, Alexander. He is born in Russia. Now he's a citizen of Ukraine and. Uh, uh, we met him uh, near 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 Kivorik. It's in the central Ukraine, with the house. And uh, we liked him very much. I mean, we were talking with him about cars, about what they need, what their needs, what needs they have. And uh, by that time, his birthday. 
Kevin, and we asked what we would you like to, to get as a present, and he said, uh, I'm on a uh, No, why not? He wants to watch birds, for example, no, or birds, enemy. Actually, actually, actually enemy, but, 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 but. how are you called? Binoculars. Binoculars. And uh, his uh, uh, commander said, bullshit, he doesn't need binoculars, buy him protection from bullets, from explosions, and so on. So we collected money, people of Lithuania gave the money, and we bought this, I call it costume, because I don't know how to call it correctly. It's like I mean, a bulletproof vest, but much more enhanced. Yeah, it protects right. hands, it protects... Uh, Is anybody arm. in the military, do you know how it's called in English? Nope. Okay. okay so if you costume. find out, let us know. <laughs> and so here, here Alexander, whose uh, nickname is Muri, because of his uh, last name, Muravyov, it means, in short, it's Muri, is presented by his commander with this costume, and the uh, commander says, now the enemy will think that you are commander because of this wonderful fancy costume. Fancy. <laughs> And it unfortunately happened that Alexander was uh, injured badly. And uh, doctors who saved him said, if not that costume, he would certainly lose his hand and probably bleeding to death. So after this happened, it became so clearly, so clear for me that everything that you can buy for money is just money and nothing else. So the life of this man was saved by 1,500 euros. 1,500 euros and the man is alive. If not that costume, he probably will be dead. And when you see such a story, it helps to help them. I mean, it inspires. So I will just um, continue the slideshow. Any other questions? So that's how it looks like reporting, right, about Ukraine? Yes. Oh. So do you, do you think that, um, like I'm just trying to get to somewhere, but do you think like the U.S. would allow China to put missiles in Mexico? Like why would they put it? Yeah. But I'm sure that China, uh, that United States will allow China to take pressure up to uh, Uralis. Ural mountains. Yes. No, the Asian part. Do, do you not think it's like, so like, so you do think the U.S. would oppose Chinese missiles like right on the border? Not in the next 50 years, okay. I guess. And so would you say Russia similarly uh, does not want NATO missiles right next to them? Russia doesn't want NATO missiles, but Russia didn't want uh, Baltic Sea to become NATO late, as we call it now, right? Not everything depends on Russia's wishes and, and what I'm just, yeah, from my Russia's perspective. I don't know. It's like a I mean, publication. I know. If, if, if I would know the answer, I would be very happy to, to look to the future. But yeah. I don't know. I think uh, it will take time. So I know a lot of Ukrainians speak both Russian and Ukrainian. A lot of them speak Russian as their first language. And the military has a lot of, I guess, Russian-speaking units. So how has that kind of like a view of Russian, the language, changed, like s since the um, full-scale invasion? It depends. Uh, we have uh, can hold them friends who are Ukrainian officers, and they do not uh, feel any problem to speak Russian, some of them do, and they speak only Ukraine. I met kids from eastern parts of Ukraine, which is uh, naturally Russian-speaking Ukrainians. I mean, they, they are Ukrainians, but they do speak Russian. Uh, we have some refugees in Lithuania, and I've met one family 
the uh, young children, and they do not speak other language than Russian. But the tendency is very clear that people are trying to speak Ukrainian, if even if they do speak bad language. I mean, they you can feel how it hurts them to to to, to hear or to speak Russian. But uh, it's not that, you know, sometimes I hear that Russian language will be banned in, in Ukraine. They do speak Russian, a lot of them. I don't know what will happen in, in the future, of course, but by now they do speak Russian. Russian gas? Are they still using? What are they? Because all of it. I, I would say all of it. I mean, okay. some some of them are corrupted. We have a uh, few stories, like a famous journalist in Germany was paid by uh, Putin's uh, friend, let's say, okay, uh, like sixty hundred thousand. A million of Europe's. I mean, it's a lot of money, right? And he has an influence on the people. It helps to to convince them that it's not our business. The gas, also, and some are simply stupid. They simply forget what happened 50 years ago. They can't remember what happened 50 years ago. And somehow they just think that Putin would never come for them. This fear of the attack too. Like that's what's gonna happen. Are they pros in the fear? I would say they are trying not to think about it. Just yes, like 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 you know. I don't remember who uh, was the first who said that uh, Europe is like a small kitty is sitting on the railways watching to the train and thinking, no, it's not about us. It's not about us. It's not a train. It is a train, and it's coming. But look, we have uh, debris of rockets are falling to Poland, to Romania, and it doesn't wake people somehow. I don't know why. So what decision would be the European Parliament to supply, to, to, to make more military supplies to Ukraine? It could be, yes, it could be, sure. But you know, the European Parliament does not have money to 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 buy all it. So just the countries, separate yeah. countries. Yeah, it should all I know you had a big campaign where you collected money from Ukraine to buy. We we call it safety uh, safety kit. It means it includes anti drone personal, solo anti drone people. I mean, it's like you know, just uh, you put it on your shoulder. Or Back. And you have a uh, so called safe space for you and for somebody who's standing or going uh, next to you. But you know, it doesn't, uh, doesn't say from uh, very powerful drones who can drop uh, grenades from like two kilometers high or something like that. But it's better than nothing. Yes, Lithuania collected eight million euros in one month's time. Do you know any other countries in the world doing anything like that? Yes, they are doing, yes. Poles uh, last year did something like this. Uh, I've never heard that they would do something this year. They organized blockades on the roads. My son yesterday came back to Lithuania from Ukraine and he sent me videos. The uh, highways are blocked by uh, Agricultural machines. Can you understand what is it? Tractors, combined tractors. Yeah, yes. those yeah. combined harvesters. Yeah. And, and you know, this is absolutely, I mean, the 
mind blowing because Poland is next in the line. And Poland is sending ammunition to Ukraine at the time, same time, Poles are blocking highways. I mean, how can you understand that? I, I'm, I, I can't. So this is that the initiative that was mentioned. So they collected, uh, it says 7 point, uh, seven thousand. It's actually eight. One package is... Uh, oh, that's about yeah, package, yes, yes, right. Yes. But they collected 8 million, over 8 million euros. Oh. And this is a journalistic and civic initiative. So it's what uh, people can do, right? Not even the governments. And besides this guy, he is not even a Slovenian, he is a Swede. <laughs> Cooperation of Baltic Sea nations <laughs> at its best. Equal in the United States. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So there was, um, in the beginning of the war, there was a very interesting event when uh, Lithuanians bought Bayraktar. And this was just, um, again, another civic initiative when countries hesitated. People collected, uh, if I remember correctly, 14, 14, 14, 14 million euro. Were you part of that yes, uh, sure. initiative? Mm -hmm. Could you tell us more from inside? I'm just talking that people, please donate. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing else. I mean, it was not difficult. It wasn't difficult. But then it was kind of, you know, showing to other European countries, yes. look what citizens can do, and you are just debating and are not sure whether to send um, military equipment to Ukraine or not. And after that, I believe, you know, they send um, the other European countries also. Yes, and Turkey, Turkey presented also for free. Turkey, yes. yes. <laughs> and and uh, this was in 2002. 2022. Last year, we collected. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm mistaken. You. We five millions were for buy repairs, and 14, 14, 14 millions were for radars. Mm -hmm. So we bought 14 radars for Ukraine. And uh, you know, it's very easy when you're asking for someone, not yourself. I, 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 I belong to those people who hesitate to ask something for myself. I mean, I feel bad. But when it comes to Ukraine, I, I'm asking for money every, every day because this is all I can do. If I could fight, maybe I would fight, but no, I'm not a fighter. I mean, we have to be trained, otherwise you are you know, burdened at the war. So it's better to help as you can. Hmm. May I ask a question? Uh, do you, as a journalist in Lithuania, do you uh, see some attempts of Russian misinformation, of Russian propaganda trying to influence? How do you fight against it as a journalist? What's your advice for us here in this country to fight against that kind of propaganda? How do we recognize it? How do we resist it? Yes, we do have a lot of uh, mis uh, misinformation, misconduction, um, propaganda, because uh, you know that sentence, sentence, if you repeat the lie many times, people start to believe that it's true. So uh, just check facts. I mean, if somebody lies to you, you know what you do in your private life in your usual life. If somebody lies, you do not believe them. Or if she or he lies, you never believe again. <coughs> if someone is mistaken and it does not lie, they always would say, sorry, it was a mistake. If the mistake is not recognizable, it means it's on purpose. Then you just don't listen and uh, do not believe. Does it help? So you so you, do you do you believe that Russia, as a as a country, is systematically trying to influence the information space in yes, the I Western agree. Europe and US? Yes, because Russia launched uh, English-speaking channels. What would be the reason why they would do that? They are trying to reach English-speaking audience, and they did it like 
almost 30 years, 20 years ago, Russia to be such a channel. They launched it uh, right before Crimea. I mean, not right before Crimea, but 10 years before Crimea, or approximately 10 years. So, yes, they are, they are making attempts to affect the Western audience, and they are good in it. You know, uh, before this trip, uh, we had an interview with uh, uh, Mr. Landsbergis, who was uh, a speaker of the Lithuanian Parliament in 1990. Uh, in fact, he was the uh, first leader of uh, the state which regained independence. And he said, he's reading a lot, of course, and he said, why Russia? why Western countries do not read what Lenin said. Because Lenin said once that we will hang them, uh, rope. Rope. On a, by a rope. rope, by a rope, and the Westerners will pay for that rope. Meaning the Ukrainians will hang? Who, no, 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 no. Lenin, Europe, the Europe. Oh, Europe. Uh, yes. Or Westerners in common. Okay. Well, this, this their doctrine didn't change. So, do you believe that uh, Russia was trying to influence American election during the last election? I hope that Russia is not able to influence American elections. I mean, if I would say that, uh, that I do believe that Russia would like to, but I think that. America is able to protect its own uh, instrument of democracy. And when Trump says that I do not believe in election, I see is it's as a threat to democracy, but not made by Russia. Right, a few more questions, yeah? Um, it's kind of a two-part question, but um, if Russia was to win the war in Ukraine, um, would you fear uh, I know Lithuania is in NATO, but would you fear that um, you could be next, or any state in the Baltics? And um, do you also fear if, like, the U.S. might, you know, appease Russia, maybe, and just let Russia take yes. the Baltics? Yes, I do. First of all, uh, I do not. I'm not sure that. Okay, let's start from the beginning. We are NATO members, but you know, the first uh, article <coughs> has to be a vote for how to say it. Who knows how long it will take? Lithuania is too small. I mean, it's like four hours to, to cross it. And uh, if Ukraine will fall, I have no doubt that Lithuania could be also attacked. And I am afraid that uh, Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact wasn't happened only once. I'm, I'm not sure that it will never happen again. Because otherwise I can't explain why Europe and United States are just so calmly watching what's happening now. So everybody knows, re remembers Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, right? So when Nazis and Soviets divided their influence zone and interest zone. They divided Europe. I'm not trying. I, I'm not trying to frighten you. I'm just sharing my opinion. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, I think in the news right now, we see a lot about um, Ukrainian men as soldiers and stuff. When you were on the ground over there, can you talk a bit about <coughs> what the women are doing for the war effort? Who was there? Who was there? I don't. I don't. I'm how different. <laughs> I, I, didn't hear, I didn't hear it either. What's women's role in the Ukrainian war? What women are doing? What like women are fighting? Yes, as I understand. Motor Rick Schmeckere. Oh, okay. oh no. women. Oh, well, if they are well trained, I mean. They are soldiers, and I've met women soldiers, and we saw, we have here a picture of, of one girl who is an uh, officer. And uh, I have one story which I had never a chance to film uh, from the beginning to the end. The uh, mother and wife is fighting at the, at the front. 
uh, near to which city she is now it doesn't matter to front line and her husband is uh, at home in Dnipro with their small uh, with, uh, toddler I mean you know if he is not prepared well enough to fight why sh why he should go to the war if she is trained and ready so she's fighting and I know a few commanders who are happy to, to have women in their team in their teams and why are they happy? Hmm? why are they happy just because uh, as they say uh, it somehow um, mobilizes Is that mm -hmm. right word? because you know the people in the war they say you know what is the first sign that a uh, soldier is uh, failing or giving up giving up maybe that would be the right word when uh, he stops to uh, brush his teeth and when the woman is between soldiers I know it sounds six, six <laughs> but it helps them. They want to brush, brush teeth and to, to just keep it in order. I'm not sure it's the best argument, but I'm just telling you what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of women Yes, sir. Yes. About 40,000. Wow. Yeah. It's not a lot, of course, by comparison with you know, the million, which is a the number but at least and Ukraine uh, made a tender for uh, uniform sports especially for women like three months ago <coughs> because nobody nobody was prepared that so many women will go to, to, to the war well you had a question yes and speaking of Ukrainians uh, both uh, fighting and civilians have you noticed any um, like like an internal conflict about fighting a people so close to themselves in both history and culture, and even in, in Lithuania. Like, I'm not sure how much is similar uh, between Russia and Ukraine and Lithuania, aside from the USSR. But have you noticed any like uh, discontentment or like just just internal struggle about? Well, I know there are like different families on both sides of the, the border. Is, just, is there anything? Any, that meant for I would surprise you, but I can't hear what you say. Speak louder, please. Like, um, being uh, Russia and Ukraine being so close culturally, uh, and with people having relatives on both sides of the border, mm -hmm. is there any um, like personal conflict uh, in soldiers and civilians um, that like that just keeps them up? Or okay, you know. Um, it's one of the myths that they are very close culturally. I mean, a lot of myths were created by Soviet Union that is like one nation and so on. It is not. Yes, they were uh, neighbors, this is true. And people uh, could not believe that they would be attacked by the members. A lot of family members are, you know, in most countries. Even, I don't know if you're aware, uh, the family of uh, current commander of uh, Ukrainian uh, forces, his family lives in Russia and supports Putin. His former family, I mean, former wife and, and parents also. This is a problem. But uh, the common culture as it is presented, I do not think it's a problem. At least not that uh, big. So we have uh, time. There are other people who want this room. I guess there was some scheduling conflict. But uh, we have time for just really two more questions. So who would like to ask the last two questions? Yes. I have a dumb question. But earlier you said that you don't think we'll be able to see peace with Russia in our lifetimes. I have a question. And my question is. We've been at war with many nations in history where in relatively short periods of times we were able to create peaceful relationships with them. 
and for instance, like us in between the United States and Vietnam, you know, a lot more people died in that war than are currently dying in the war in Ukraine. But right now, we're really close allies with each other. Why isn't that possible for Russia? Why isn't it possible to Russia? Why isn't it possible for us to be able to one day have peaceful relationships with Russia? But in the past, we've had peaceful relationships with countries we have not spent the war with. Maybe the answer is what Russia is by itself. I mean, uh, it could be theoretically, but the Russia has uh, to change, which is not possible. I mean, how can you be in peaceful relations with someone who, who wants who wants fight you, who is positioning everything against Western world? If you if you would pay attention, what Russia is talking about, the United States as a common, as they call Anglo-Sax, whatever it means. I mean, those are bad. We are good. We are better. Those are worse. So how, how can you stick in peaceful relations? I don't know. Wait, one more question. Um, <laughs> stuff but if you would like to get a photo with flags you are very welcome and Rita Deluga not with flags of course. <laughs> I'm tired too although I'm not jet lagged. So you are very welcome to come to the front and, and get a photo. And uh, I'll put the other